We know that covenants are central to our spiritual development. Indeed, the word covenant was mentioned nearly 300 times in April 2024's General Conference Addresses alone. But do we understand covenant in its eternal magnificence and importance? Have you ever wondered what is the new and everlasting covenant, and how does it relate to the covenants we make in the temple? How do I know when I've been accepted by the Lord into a covenant relationship? What does embodying the five temple covenants actually look like? How is the Lord going to fulfill the covenant made with our ancient fathers and mothers? Do I have a role in that great and marvelous work? If so, what is it? In an effort to explore these vital questions and more, the Latter-day Disciples are pleased to announce our third conference, Awake and Ascend, The Covenant of the Fathers. This online event will be held June 28th and 29th and will feature podcast guest favorites, including Todd McLaughlin, Dave Butler, Josh Chandler, Corey Jensen, as well as new faces Donna Nielsen, author of Beloved Bridegroom, and Julia Wenzel of the Way to Christ YouTube podcast. Attendees of the 2023 Awake and Ascend conferences described these events as wonderful, so beautiful, I learned and the Spirit confirmed, and it did not disappoint. I have been craving the meat of the gospel, and each and every speaker provided just that. Register today and secure access to this two-day event, a downloadable PDF notes packet, and exclusive post-event Q&A with the presenters. As a registered nonprofit, all proceeds go to cover expenses and to charitable giving. Together, we hope to rend the veil of unbelief, preparing us to call upon the Father in Jesus Christ's name, with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, that we will come to know that the Father hath remembered the covenant which He made unto our fathers. Join us at Awake and Ascend. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Latter-day Disciples podcast. I am so thrilled to be joined by Allie Duzette. Allie is a teacher, speaker, author, and practitioner in the fields of health and wellness and the science of medical intuition. She has a passion for exploring the power of human consciousness and self-awareness and offers a variety of programs and courses supporting personal development. She delights in helping others to massively expand their own intuition so they can heal themselves and their families on an emotional, physical, and spiritual level. Allie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I'm so thrilled by Allie and her work. I enjoy her YouTube channel and some of the books, and I'm excited to talk about that today. So Allie, can you give us a little bit more of your backstory and what was it that really got you interested in understanding the polarity between masculine and feminine men and women? Oh, yes, man. Well, I write about, I write about my story a little bit in, in my book, Magnetic Femininity. Uh, it basically happened in a way that I didn't really want, which was, I felt like God was telling me that I had to change. I, I was not thrilled about the state of my marriage and I went to the temple about it. And I said, God, I want permission to be done. Uh, that's what I want. And what I got, um, was shocking. I felt like God said, open your scriptures. And I opened my scriptures to first Corinthians 11, 11, which talks about the man being the head of the woman. And I wanted to throw up, you know, and, mm-hmm. and God was like, don't throw up, just flip the <laughs> scriptures open again. I flipped over to, um, is it first Peter three, two, which is another one about wives submitting to their husbands. I'm like, okay, what, what is this God? Mm-hmm. And he's like, don't, no, no, keep flipping. And I'm flipping and being horrified by, I, I like found like basically every single scripture that hits on masculine feminine polarity, which there's not a lot of them. So it wasn't mm-hmm. Like on the one hand, it was very hard because what are the odds that I'm right. <laughs> on this the is obviously hand. divine and I don't love that. <laughs> exactly. But then there's, there's not a whole lot of scriptures about this. And so I feel, I felt like I got them all. And I felt like God just said, you, like, you do not have permission to do what you want with this situation. You need to be more feminine. Like if you want to have a happier life, you have to change it, You can't, you can't blame other people. You have to be the one to change. And the way you have to do it is by being more feminine. And I said, um, well, fine, but like, but how, how does one do that? And I actually, I had been, 
um, reading this one guy's blog and he would talk about masculine feminine sometimes. And I, but from a, from a very masculine perspective that at times was demeaning to women, but I, I appreciated his scientific stance because he would post a lot of articles about like the science, like our brains are different and these different, you know, different aspects mm -hmm. of like biological reality. And I emailed him and I said, okay, I, I am trying to be more feminine and I don't know how help me and he actually posted my email and made fun of me on the blog and that was very horrifying and I said okay I can't turn to a man for mm -hmm. help feminine. I need to figure out another option and so um God kind of led me to find certain books that I used to recommend and now I don't anymore because I feel like I wrote a much better book than any of the <laughs> ones that I read but I I started reading all sorts of books and and testing them out and I and I would ask God what to do and be led in the specific things to do to help with my own marriage and my own life. And I don't know, that was 10 years ago now. It was 20, uh, 2013 and 2014. And for many years, I wanted to write this book, but it all just kind of flowed out of me in like three weeks last year, last summer. Um, and I feel like there's no way I could have written it any time except that time. Mm -hmm. And uh it took 10 years of synthesizing all of this information and data and finding all of the different unique resources and perspectives that I feel like I had to put together into a text that would be understandable and applicable for normal people. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the feminine energy resources out there can be kind of woo-woo or they can be kind of... Um, confusing or they can be they can feel demeaning and mm -hmm. gross to read I mean like who has read a book that says like just submit submit and you feel like you want to throw up all day mm -hmm. um because I've read those right and I did not love it <laughs> and right. so, uh so anyway I've spent 10 years now digging into this and trying to figure it out for my own sake because I had problems that I needed to fix and I knew from God that feminine energy was the answer and so th that has kind of led me to where we are today. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I, th I feel like it's so relatable. And yet at the same time, this is a root of a problem that we never, ever, ever think about or talk about. Um, I think that understanding the energetic balance in yourself and then also with your spouse and how that all comes together we don't understand what a huge play that that has into our, into our personal individual spiritual relationship and into our relationship with our spouse. So can we talk about the spiritual side of it first in the book? I really love how you said, like, if you are not aligned to your spiritual energy, then you will not be aligned spiritually to God is kind of a really horrible paraphrase. But can can you first off edit what I just said, because you have the correct words and then expound on that a little bit. Why is it so important for us as both men and women to have a correct alignment in ourselves before we're able to pursue greater spiritual growth? Yeah, this is a, this is a really great question. And I think a really important question because, and, and something that, I think most people misunderstand. And also when I've tried to explain it, people misunderstand me. And then I'm like, no, that's not what I mean, guys. <laughs> um, but let's, if I can back up a little bit to the symbol of the yin yang, the yin yang symbol, you know, like a circle, it has like a little swirl and the little circles inside. For a lot of years, people have really internalized that this represents one person. And that you're supposed to have an equal balance inside of yourself of, of male and female. You should have an, an equal balance inside of your masculine and feminine. We want our men to embrace their feminine sides. We want our women to embrace their masculine sides. As I've been led down this path of research into this, especially from a spiritual and even religious perspective, I have really come away from my research, looking at that symbol as not a symbol of one person, but a symbol of two people. That is a symbol of marriage, eternal marriage, you might say. Mm -hmm. Two people. And one side is going to be 90% feminine with 10% masculine. The other side is going to be 90% masculine with 10% feminine. Every person does have a masculine side and a feminine side. But my understanding is that people who are born biologically female need to be expressing about you know, 80, 90% feminine energy to be really in alignment with their own 
physical and spiritual biology. And people who are born biologically male need to be expressing a 90, 80 to 90 percent masculine energy and the remainder more feminine energy to be in spiritual alignment. And I know that that is very controversial. And I will say I personally have a lot, not maybe not a lot, but I do have friends that, you know, identify as whatever they identify as. And I know that this idea of biological gender um, comes under a lot of scrutiny. But in my own work, what I have found is that when people do align, if they align themselves emotionally, spiritually, um, behaviorally, with the energies that match their physical biological body my my observation has been that they do feel happier and they do feel a greater sense of connection to our creator and i know uh, who who would have guessed 20 years ago that this would be a highly right <laughs> topic to bring up but here we are <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it used to be not controversial <laughs> yeah now all. it is controversial right. so right Right. That is just my opinion, but right. But this is so huge because basically what you're saying there, first off, I, I love how you break it down in that there is, there is a ratio for men and women, right? There is masculine and feminine in both of us, but we need to be leaning very, very heavily towards what we are right in that you and I need to have a heavy feminine energy. Our husbands need to have a heavy masculine energy. Um, this is really important because as I have thought about um, alignment, integration in spiritual terms, talking about what it means to be justified, what it means to be sanctified. I actually think this is a huge part of the process of sanctification is coming into proper balance. And that begins, actually, I think it begins our balance between us and God. Um, and I think that there's kind of a spark and in initiation that brings us into an alignment there. But then the next part of it is aligning our body and our spirit right? And so if our body is female, then our energy that we need to be channeling is the feminine energy and vice versa, right? If you have a masculine body, it needs to be a masculine energy that you're embodying. And so this is a huge part of not just, you know, our, it has a very wide practical application, but I really think it does have this super broad spiritual application too. What are some of the connections that you've seen between our physical bodies, our flesh, our ability to um, enhance our physical well-being as a result of pursuing and attaining that um, correct energetic alignment? Oh, what an interesting <laughs> question. Okay, so our physical effects that we see from attaining our more spiritual mm -hmm. alignment with masculine and feminine. Yeah. Well, this is, a, this is a really great question. Nobody's asked me this before, um, but it is really important. You know, the ma masculine energy and masculine bodies on a physiological level have a much greater capacity for handling stress hormones. Mm. Uh, when you throw stress at a man, it increases his testosterone and makes him like more aggressive and more ready to like go out there and get the job done. When you throw stress at a woman, uh, it gives us autoimmune disorders, chronic mm. illness, chronic pain, uh, excess fat. It triggers obesity. It triggers fertility problems. Okay. When men step into their masculine energy, they find themselves actually getting physically stronger. They're going to be healthier and happier. They're going to be able to go out there. And I mean, it's kind of a two-way street, masculine strength, physical strength is undeniably real. Um, but also I, I just went to a court of honor for an Eagle Scout this past week. And I, I haven't been to one of those in a very long time. And I forgot that they they do their little Boy Scout pledge to um, to remain physically strong. Mm. And I, I loved that because I think it is a masculine duty to be physically strong. We, humanity without the physical strength of men, like what, where are we? It's a disaster. Like this mm -hmm. is in the technological world that we live today, which was mostly built by men. I, I hate to inform us all. <laughs> um, <laughs> they also invented most of the technology, but they also have the bodies that have built everything that existed prior to the invention of, you know, cranes and all of the different equipment that we use to build things. Uh, when men step when into their masculine energy, they're building their physical strength. When women step into their feminine energy, they're letting go of their cortisol reactions and they're able to actually heal their physical bodies because they're 
in the zone that we're meant to be in where we are resting and relaxing and allowing our bodies to focus on the things that female bodies are supposed to be focusing on. I mean, we have our hormone cycles and everything. Our bodies are meant to be focused on our own bodies and not on the big stresses of the world. Sorry, I cut you off. What were you going to say? No, no, no. You're just fine. Well, what I was going to say, and maybe this can lead into, did you finish that thought or did you have more you wanted to share? Okay. Um, this can kind of lead into the next question. I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit because obviously this is a topic that you and I both have some familiarity with. So when we say masculine energy and feminine energy, we have an idea of what that means. Maybe we should take a step back and actually define like what is masculine energy versus feminine. And I think that what you were talking about, about how, um, our structure, our, uh, what's the word, our infrastructure that is a very masculine thing, right? It is order. It is building buildings, right? It is containing and organizing. That's a very masculine energy. Whereas to the feminine side of that, I would say that the feminine is much more fluid. It's very nuanced. I think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and I feel like they both embody the masculine and feminine energy so well. When you think about Adam saying, this is what I'm going to do. It's black or white. I'm just going to go and do it. And Eve is like, actually, I feel like there's some gray here. And like, we can kind of make both of these things fit together. If you look at it from this perspective and yeah, we have to bend the rules a little bit, but like it can all work out. I feel like that's a pretty good example of masculine and feminine. So what other descriptors would you give? Let's go through the masculine first, because I think that's much easier to see. We live in a very masculine world. (laughs) And then from there, we can easily more easily look at the opposite side of it where which is where we begin to see the feminine would you mind yeah sure and if I can I want to back up even further to acknowledge all of the triggers that come Mm. up with a discussion of masculine feminine because I remember Mm. when I first was researching this I felt a lot of disgust a lot of horror I felt um even some shame as I started reading about it I felt a lot of shame that everything that I liked about myself was my masculine qualities. Mm -hmm. And I felt a lot of disgust at feminine qualities. And I didn't see how you could be um, a worthwhile human and exhibit feminine qualities. Like that's a terrible Mm -hmm. thing to say, but I just couldn't. But I just want to acknowledge that if anybody else there's feeling really triggered, hang in there. It's okay. I also was triggered. It's okay. Um, So let's talk about masculine and feminine. I think a really great example of this, of masculine and feminine is in your own body you have a dominant side and a non-dominant side, your left hand, right hand. Most humans are, you know, right-handed. And so that's considered the masculine side. Um, And then the feminine side would be the left hand. Uh, The masculine side is the one that's going to be taking control. It's going to be leading. It's going to be making the decisions and really making things happen in the more obvious way, whereas the left Uh, the feminine side is going to be the stabilizing side, the side that is holding things, um, keeping things together in, in a little bit of a more subtle way in in the analogy of our hands. uh, This came to me while I was making cookies and I was holding a bowl and stirring. And I, and I heard God say, um, you are the left hand, you know? And I, I thought, oh, I'm, and so like, here we have this like masculine hand that's going to be doing the stirring and the left hand is holding the bowl. It's a much less glamorous job. It doesn't look as important, but you try stirring cookie dough without holding the bowl. Like, come on, you Mm -hmm. can't, you know, or let's try writing a letter without holding your paper down. Like Mm -hmm. this, it's a disaster or, or let's try it the other way. Let's have our right hand, hold the paper down and try writing with your left hand. And it's going to be a disaster when we switch hands. Um, I think it's a really good example of how things work when um, masculine and feminine try to reverse roles Mm. in a marriage or even outside of a marriage. um, For our single listeners, a lot of times when people are chronically single, it comes down to an issue of polarity and that they are not expressing the polarity that that they need to be in order to magnetically attract the other person into Mm. their life. So so Mm. let's talk about some sorry, some of these. exact descriptors of Mm -hmm. masculine and feminine Um, really quick while you pull that up can i just share an image so one of the things that the lord led me to as i was studying this was ancient egypt because ancient egypt i think has a it seemed to me that they had a really good alignment energetically and physically between men and masculine energy and feminine women 
women and feminine energy. And in Egypt, a lot of the imagery that you see is that the queen was representative of the throne and of the kingdom itself. And the man was the king. So why is that important? Well, a king without a throne and a kingdom is nothing. And vice versa, a queen who is the throne in the kingdom without a king, it, it just doesn't work. And so you begin to see, like, we have been programmed to think that by saying that the woman is not the king, that means she's worthless, right? And that's where a lot of those triggers come from. I actually believe it's one of the first lies that Satan introduced into the world is that women are less than men. And so we are now 6,000 years ingrained in that idea. Right. And the reality is trauma. it's so much generational trauma, but guess what? The Lord is raising up this generation of women who are recognizing it. Right. And now he's going to start giving us the tools. And I think our heavenly parents, our heavenly mother is giving us the tools to say, no, that's not true. There is a proper alignment here. You guys are equal partners, but you have to learn what that looks like in an eternal heavenly sense and not just in the worldly sense. And we'll we'll come back to that because I want to talk about how all of the problems in the world are manifested in an imbalance in these things. So so we'll come back to that. But I just wanted to share that image to help listeners see like what you were saying about the right hand and the left hand. Like the left hand is not less. The throne and the kingdom are not less just because they're not the king. You need both. Yes. I love that so much. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, and I'm, I'm hearing this and thinking about when I was first introduced to this. And even though I like understood it, I still felt emotionally triggered. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that that's like very easy to, to be, because you're totally right. We're dealing with 6,000 years of trauma and drama Mm -hmm. around this Mm -hmm. issue. And a lot of, um, I mean, it is, it is real. Like women have truly suffered at the hands of men for generations. And, Mm -hmm. um, and men have suffered at the hands of women. I'll right. too, I'll say that too. But right. uh, but and men and women are both delivered by the hands of men too. Jesus that, Christ is a man, and that's important that is for true. us to remember. That is yeah. true. And mm-hmm. he was born of a woman. Which, yes. as a little side note, um, <laughs> in the Catholic Church, I, I once took a whole college class only about Hildegard von Bingen, who was a Catholic saint in like the 1200s, and she was actually the first person to ever like point out to the catholic church that mary was a woman so maybe we should stop hating women so much and that's why she's a saint basically like she did a bunch of well she was the one that was like guys you hate women but mary was a woman they were like oh oh I guess so. you know oh my gosh that's <laughs> amazing there's been, there's been a lot of uh of horrible stuff about this but mm-hmm. um but okay i'll read this one little paragraph really quick nature wise masculine energy is like the earth and feminine energy is like water The earth is steady, stable, and solid. Water is always moving, always bringing life wherever it goes. Without both earth and water, life cannot exist. You need both. One is not better or more important than the other. Beautiful. Yeah, I was thinking about, you know, a way that I have kind of been taught to think about this. Our Heavenly Father, right? The ultimate masculine energy, the ultimate healthy, balanced masculine energy that we want all our men to be, right? Um, his role, if we could kind of separate these things out, uh, if we could take the yin and the yang apart, which is so hard to do once they're brought together. But if we could, we would see that he is the one who orders matter, right? He is organizing. He is creating in that capacity. And what is it that our heavenly mother does? Our heavenly mother gives the breath of life, right? Just like that water. I love how you said it's life giving, That is what women do. That is the priestesshood that we are all a part of, is that we give life. But in order to do that, in order to bestow the breath of life, we have to breathe. And I feel like women have forgotten how to breathe (laughs) over the, over, you know, over the centuries because of this imbalance. Hi. The baby doesn't like the floor right now. Okay. Baby doesn't like the floor. (laughs) We're going to hang out. You're a good prop for this discussion. And that's true. Talk about bringing life into the world. <laughs> I know how fortuitous. It's like I planned it, but I didn't. <laughs> anyway, so so that was just a thought that I had is that our job is to breathe life. And that means we need to be living. We need to have breath. We need to have space to be able to nurture and care for and love 
our family. And so it is good for our men to step up and take those things off of our plate that is take that is making us breathless that is that is inhibiting our ability to do that yeah thank you i mean i think in the modern world i would bet that most people listening can relate to this stereotype of the woman is the one managing the calendar for the family she's driving everybody everywhere she's possibly managing the checkbook she's she's the one worried about the taxes she's the one um worried about everything and the husband is is very often showing up for work uh and then uh then what then maybe he's hanging out and uh mm-hmm. and so i think that that's playing video games watching yeah. youtube spending yeah. an hour in the bathroom <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. i think we all can relate to this right <laughs> i think that, that this is like the normal this is the new normal where um you know I don't know. It's it's been an interesting development culturally where, you know, a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, of course, women would not ne- this would never have existed because we weren't allowed to, right? Mm-hmm. Like legally, um, there was just so much that women could not do. And now we can do it. So we are doing it. And then we're doing everything. And men are floating about aimlessly, feeling this like purposelessness that they channel into porn video games and then and women are being stressed out of their minds managing everything they've taken over all of it and I don't know that's kind of a kind of where I was at you know when I first started getting into this and I felt I felt very horrified at this idea that this dynamic was my fault somehow Mm. um which I don't think is how I would put it I think Mm -hmm. but like in the moment that's how I felt Right. Like what the, I made this happen because mm-hmm. I'm not feminine enough barf. And Oh, the way out is, I mean, of course at the time, the only word I could find was submission. I'm like, mm. ew, ew, what I'm supposed to submit to, right. to this. Like, are you kidding me? You mm-hmm. know? And, and the reality is like, yes, I was <laughs> like, you are kidding you. Like, that's not how it works. There's a lot more to this story, you know, right. but in the moment, um, <laughs> man, it was, it was a very horrifying thing, but I think there's a lot of women who, who are realizing that, uh, that women having it all, having all the responsibilities of men and all the responsibilities of women, it's not really a fun life. Mm -mm. It's, it's, it's not just not a fun life. It is a life that actively leads to chronic conditions, autoimmune conditions, chronic illness, um, all kinds of both emotional and mental and physical biological problems. It, it's not just that it's not very fun. It actively mm-hmm. destroys lives and marriages and right. and everything that you, you can right. imagine. It, right. I don't know, it's a mess. Well, and the other thing too is women, like our bodies are the book on priestesshood. They are. Like the men get the Book of Mormon and the Bible and all that stuff. Like it's all very masculine, right? But we have, it's innate in us if we can tune into it. I love how you talk about intuition in the book. It's true that women have innate spiritual gifts by virtue of who we are, by virtue of the fact that we came here to give our lives to bring forth more life in a very, very Christ-like pattern. And so what is the best way for the adversary to divert us from being able to tune into those spiritual gifts? I think that it is to bombard us with all of these other things that are not our responsibility and that inhibit our ability to actually hear that intuitive voice inside of us that directs us in how to take care of ourselves, that directs us in how to take care of our husbands and how to take care of our families and how to come to find God. Um, It really is all a part of the same puzzle. Um, A little bit about my story. I, um, at the beginning of 2023, I was praying for sanctification. That was my intention for the year. And within a couple of days, the Lord answered that prayer in a really obvious way. And the answer to that prayer was, you have to know your heavenly mother. And I was like, okay, interesting. I never been a feminist. Um, she wasn't really something that crossed my mind. I felt pretty satisfied with the Well, actually I wasn't satisfied with Heavenly Father just protects her because I think part of me is like, she's a goddess. I feel like she could probably handle it. Um, But I kind of came up with my own reasoning, which is that, well, he's not making her be quiet. So maybe she is just quiet on purpose. Like maybe, maybe there's a lesson for me in that. 
Um, and I think that there's some truth in that. I now have a totally different understanding. I believe that she is veiled and that she invites us to find her when we're ready, when we're ready to find her for who she is and not what she can do for us. I think sometimes we, we approach her with that, but what's really interesting. And I was realizing this just this morning as I was reading your book is that I got that answer. And so, you know, me, I've got all the masculine energy, so I'm going to run headlong trying to do all of that, right. To figure out my heavenly mother. And the first thing that happens is I lose my job, like within a week of this happening. And I didn't see that at the time, but I had always been the breadwinner in my family. And I was making six figures. We we were just buying a brand new, big, beautiful house. Um, and my salary was the one that was supporting it. My husband was trying to figure out still what he was doing. Um, that was kind of a long journey throughout our marriage. Has kind of, it, it was uh, he's he's found some stability now, <laughs> you guys. But um, for a while, it was really hard. He was going to school, and then he was changing careers very often. wasn't really satisfied with anything. And so I lost my job and I was pregnant with this cute little baby. Um, And so I was like, well, I'll have him in May and then I'll go back to work. And so I had him and then July came around and I was thinking about, you know, starting to apply for jobs and the Lord made it really clear. I don't want you to go back to work. And I was like, okay, alrighty, we'll try that. And so my husband quite um, unexpectedly was put in this role of, Hey, you're going to be, you're going to be the provider now. Um, and I did that. That wasn't me. Like that was just the Lord guiding me and me trying to do what the Lord wanted me to do. Um, but it's striking to me to see how in trying to understand more about the divine feminine, about my heavenly mother, what they started to teach me about was myself. And it was about my own balance, my own energy and the energy between me and my spouse that had been unbalanced. And so since then, I mean, we've gone through a lot of changes and it's certainly not always easy, but my husband is, he's embodying more masculine energy than he ever has before. Like he's providing for our family. He's stepping up, wanting to take care of the finances. He's wanting to take these things off my plate. And I'm finally in a place where I will let him because like you, I always thought it was the worst. I was like, I hated the idea of being lazy. And to me, lazy was sitting on the couch and reading a book for one afternoon. I thought that that was the worst. And so now, I don't know. I just find it fascinating. Do you have any thoughts about any of that? I know that was just kind of a personal story, but I'd love to hear. Thank you for sharing that story. Because I think probably a lot of people can relate to this as well. And I, yeah, I love what you just said at the end that you finally got to a place where you would let him uh take control because i think that that really is one of the biggest struggles that women have whether they're single or married to actually trust men mm. to do the manly job so many of us feel a lot of fear about letting men take over and actually do the masculine thing a lot of us feel a lot of stress and guilt about it and shame i also was definitely um you know i've always been the person that felt like i had to you know work really hard and do all these things and so turning over a lot of that stuff to my spouse was terrifying and and i it was emotionally difficult on me for a lot of reasons but one of those reasons was it just how could I be a person that doesn't work hard and and do these things right Right. and how can I trust him to do these things when I've always been the one that did them right right yeah and I think I again I think that a lot of that has to do with an a misunderstanding of what the feminine energy actually is because what Satan says is it just means you're lazy and you don't do anything and you're just a mom. Like you don't even contribute. What are you doing? Like, you know, those are the lies that we hear, right? Being a stay at home mom is like a three is like a four letter word. Um, but that's so not how God sees women. That's so not how our heavenly mother is like, there's so much more purpose in that. So let's go back. Cause we kind of talked about the masculine energy. What is the feminine energy and how do we, how do we frame it? in a way to see its value and overcome some of those stereotypical traditions that we've received that are just garbage. Yeah. 
well the feminine energy I, I, the trouble with it i think is that a lot of the ways that we describe it are so triggery for some mm. people you know but it is more of a following energy where the masculine energy is leading the feminine energy um is the one that that follows i will i will add to that that um a leader can't lead if nobody's willing to follow <laughs> mm -hmm. so in its way the following energy is actually the leading energy because the following energy is the one that decides that uses Who's the leader its, its mm -hmm. feminine discernment and mm -hmm. wisdom to decide when to follow mm -hmm. in, in its way feminine energy is the most is is the true leading energy because yeah what's a leader without mm -hmm. followers it's nothing you know mm -hmm. but I'm sorry really quick on that I was thinking about um I was thinking about our political system a little bit and how women were not allowed to vote for the longest time. And what's so interesting about that is that when men, when men choose leaders, they're going to want to choose the strongest man, the man that can fight the hardest, the man that will win the war. Like that's kind of what a masculine energy is going to look for. Um, but if a woman is picking the leader, She's going to pick the one who wants peace. She's going to pick the one who is going to protect her children. She's going to pick the one who's not interested in war, but who wants stability and security and who wants the people to thrive. And so, yes, when we hear the word follow, we're like, eh, I don't like that. I'm not a follower. Right. But you're, you're so right. When you say that, like if, if women had been the ones to elect the leaders, before, like, and I don't want to, I'm not suggesting we cut out men. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that we would have a much different history than what it we've had. It leads to a different dynamic, right? Yes. Women mm -hmm. tend to vote overwhelmingly for, for strong social welfare programs. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is really interesting that um, single women are overwhelmingly very liberal and married women are overwhelmingly much more conservative. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a sign that women are looking for a masculine leader in their lives. And if we're married, then our husband becomes that leader. And if we're not, then we want the government to provide for us and lead us. That is what I take away from the statistics on that mm. for sure. So it is a very interesting dynamic, um, but feminine energy is, it's wise, it's discerning, um, it feels, it connects with the body. Where masculine energy is preoccupied with logic, feminine energy is preoccupied with feeling and intuition mm. and and tuning in with the feelings of our physical body for wisdom instead of just the textbook for the science facts, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you need both. You really do need both. Intuition and wisdom is really great, but it's probably not going to build you the most efficient house you know, and <laughs> logic is really great. And, you know, doing the science facts is really great. And it probably can build you a really great house, but is it going to make that house feel like a home? Is it going to, um, you know, raise emotionally well-adjusted children, right? You need both. And even every human needs both. We need our logical side and we need our intuitive side. Men, men have access to connection with our creator and access to their own intuition and women have access to their logical side and both men and women need to be um need to be finding their appropriate balance within of both of those things in order to have functional lives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. beautiful yeah i i love that example you gave i'm like yes a husband can build you a house but is he going to decorate it for christmas no he's not yeah, exactly. <laughs> we want to decorate it for Christmas. We want lights and all that. Well, he'll put up the lights because we ask him to. Um, anyway, yeah, that's beautiful. So let's talk a little bit more about how these things get unbalanced, right? Because I think that that's kind of even the tone of this conversation. There's the assumption that we're all pretty much unbalanced in ourselves and our community, our nation, the world at large is really, really unbalanced. So what happens to men and women when they perceive a lack of the opposite energy that they need for their own stability and development? Yeah, this is a great question. So my understanding and observation is that when women do not sense a strong enough masculine force, um, they, ma they self-masculinize. 
uh, we get self-protective. We build up our own emotional defenses. We don't want other people to, to get in. We shut down our own emotional vulnerability. We really start taking on the role of provider. We take on our own role of protector. Um, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that as, um, as our world has gotten more and more weirdly polarized and imbalanced, like women now are well over half of college graduates, right? Um, mm -hmm. Why are women so vastly overperforming compared to men? It's because we are masculinizing, we are masculinizing ourselves. We acutely know how vulnerable we are. And we have this incredible drive for security and safety and stability. And if a man, if we don't perceive that a man is going to protect and provide for us, we're going to do that. We are going to do that. So we go out there and we get the college degrees and we get the great jobs. And then we sit there and we actually want a man more masculine than we are, who's making more money and who is more competent and who is who is more kind and more thoughtful than we are. And it's a little bit hard to find those because statistically there is such a huge imbalance now, um, just numerically speaking. And, and also because I don't think men are looking for really masculine women. So we, we make ourselves so masculine so we can get out there and rule the world. And then we find the horrible fact that most ma masculine men don't want a woman who is acting like a man. We have made ourselves our own dream man. I made myself my own dream man. It was myself. And then my actual dream man didn't want me. You know, that's yeah. that's what I think we as women do. It, in the context of our marriages, we, we self-protect. We can get really uh, naggy and angry and resentful and bitter because our men are not fulfilling their masculine role. Well, but why aren't they? Because we are. Because we are doing a job that they won't do. But how do we get out of that dynamic? That's why I wrote my book. For men... Uh, when men do not perceive a sufficient amount of feminine energy, I think a lot of men turn to self-feminization. And what that would look like for a man a lot of times is, because um, in my book, I have the controversial line that everyone is so upset about in the introduction. I need to just edit it with one more sentence. I say that um, when men don't feel enough of feminine influence in their lives, a lot of times they self-feminize and turn to porn and video games. And then all these women say, porn and video games is not feminine. Why would you say that? The reason why I would say that is because the feminine energy receives, it relaxes, it trusts that things are going to work out for them. And um, when men are turning to porn and video games, what what is that? That's them relaxing, hanging out, receiving. Um, they're they're engaging in in you know the fantasy, their fantasy world. This is not to say that feminine energy is like delusional or something like that, but they're, they're resting and relaxing. It's instead internally of, focused though, right? It's so like also true, yeah. it's turned mm -hmm. within instead of external. The feminine energy is supposed to be focused on their internal world. Mm -hmm. And the masculine energy is supposed to be out there leading, taking control, making decisions, getting out there and focusing yeah. on the external world. When men turn to porn and video games, um, they are focused on their internal self instead of making decisions and going out there and and leading their own lives. I feel like that really is what both men and women want in men is for them to just lead their own lives, make a decision, decide what you're going to do and do it and make sure that you're doing it to bless the the other people around you. I really feel like men and healthy masculine energy when healthy masculine energy is the foundation of society, society is I mean, that, that, that is the only way that a healthy society can function. We need men to be the foundation of it, but the only way they can be the foundation of it is if they decide that instead of the porn and video games, they're going to get up, they're going to get politically involved. They're going to get informed about the issues. They're going to go make a decision. They're going to get a better job if they need one. They're going to take a look at the needs of their children and make sure that their kids are getting the opportunities that they need and the men are going to be stepping up in the role of healthcare and they're going to start taking an active role in the health of their children, the health of their wives. They're going to be active engagement, active engagers in their own life instead of these like passive whatever, these blobs on the couch that are just not involved because they because they don't know. And, and I, I don't want to, you know, demonize any any blobs on the couch you know because I think that a lot of men just don't know what to do and especially if they've married a controlling woman mm -hmm. they don't know how to reassert control without 
causing World War Three, practically, right? right. Like, or being a, or being an unhealthy masculine. There's kind of a fear of like, well, I don't want to be the dominating kind of masculine. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So it is. It is an interesting balance, mm. and and a tough one uh, when when you haven't been living it yet. Right. right. It's a tough transition, but I think you know, anytime one person steps into their appropriate energy as a woman, when you step into your feminine energy as a man, if you step into your masculine energy, there it will throw your relationship into upheaval as yeah. the roles, as the roles reverse. Because right. the thing about masculine feminine polarity is that when you have a relationship, like a romantic relationship, there is always a masculine and feminine balance that is happening the problem is if there's a lot of hatred bitterness resentment anger in your marriage the real problem is that the polarity is reversed but it's still there the wife is just in the masculine and the husband is in the feminine mm -hmm. when one person decides to alter that polarity the other person is going to naturally alter as well mm -hmm. uh kind of whether they like it or not it's kind of just how the universe works if one person decides they're going to shift this the other person is going to react to it mm -hmm. um, which is why i think a woman a woman in particular can see a huge difference in her marriage just from applying the stuff in this book right. um, without her husband being involved at all all you have to do is fix your own self and let go of the outcome with your spouse um and it's gonna it's gonna sort itself out right. um, for men, I don't have a great book yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> That's okay. Maybe a man should write it. <laughs> well, exactly. That's honestly That's been the thing is it's like we could write it, but it would be more appropriate if a man was the one to write it, right? It's true. Yeah. I mean, do men really want to hear what I have to say about this? <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. Enough men have asked me for it. I'm like, I guess I probably should, but. Uh -huh. See, so underlying this, since we've taken it there, is kind of this um, this conversation about what unrighteous dominion is, right? Because we always look at that as, well, it's a man who is oppressing someone else, another man, woman, children. But what you're saying here is that when we are imbalanced in and of ourselves, we are exercising unrighteous dominion because we are operating in a sphere that is not our own. And so that's kind of what we're just saying, right? Like we could write a book about masculine energy, but that's not our dominion. That's a man's dominion. And you wrote this book about feminine energy because that's your dominion. You are the feminine. So I don't know. What do you think about that? That's kind of an interesting level to add. I, I love that. I mean, I think in terms of masculine, feminine polarity, for sure, that is, it is us exercising unrighteous dominion when we as women step into a masculine role inappropriately and when men step into a feminine role inappropriately. And I want to mention also in, in that, um, and in my book, I have a chapter on if your spouse has ADHD, if he has autism, if he has uh, dyslexia, dyscalculia, you know, there's these, these different conditions that necessarily throw off some amount of polarity in a relationship mm -hmm. um and i don't I, I mean in those cases i think it's very appropriate to you know use your feminine energy and your wisdom and connect with god and and discover how god and your own soul feel good about applying these principles to your own marriage because all of our marriages are really different mm -hmm. um but yeah i think I think whenever we're we're stepping into a space with this that is not in alignment with with what God thinks that we should be doing, it is a form of unrighteous dominion. Mm -hmm. As far as me writing a book for men, I don't know. I'm still I'm still uh, feeling that out, but we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> no, I I think the option is totally on the table, and if the Lord tells you to do it, do it, girl. Because here's the thing: at the end of the day, the Lord's going to use all of us in our various gifts and the way that He wants to, and that is the proper alignment right? It's I true. wanted to, I wanted to be sanctified. And so he had to right side me a little bit and say, stop being so freaking masculine and doing all these things so that your husband can feel needed. Like, I think that that's a really important thing for us to say is that our men want to feel needed. And if we are taking all of the responsibility upon ourselves, they're not going to feel needed. And so what do you expect them to do? They are going to fall back into this energy of just not doing anything. Um, and and it is unhealthy for men. For women, I would characterize it differently. I would say that for women, our superpower is that we are the energy of enablement. We are, and we've talked about that a couple of times, but like we are the force that allows things to be directed by men. 
and without women doing that. And, and, and it's not even something that we actively do, right? Men, it's a very active masculine energy is very active women. I would say it's passive, but it's not passive. Like, oh, you're not doing something. It's passive because it's your presence. It's who you are. It's stepping into who you were made to be and letting that be sufficient. And, and men resonate with that. I love how you talk about in the book that men are naturally wanting to have a feminine wife who they can protect, who they can lead, who they can take care of, who they can make happy. Most men want that. You know, obviously this is kind of accepting men who are dominating and abusive and things like that. We're not really talking about that for the purposes of this conversation, but for the most part, we have to believe that our husbands love us <laughs> and that they want what's best for us. And if we learn to express to them that, the nature of our very being and just accepting who we are and how we feel will encourage them to step into their role. Yeah. Well, and if I may say a controversial thing, yet another one today, um, when it comes to very domineering and even abusive men, I honestly think that a lot of times they switch into that unhealthy expression because they have not seen enough vulnerable feminine mm. energy. And I, I talk about this in the book and I, of course, say you have to follow your own intuition. You know, there, there's not a one size fits all thing. We have to connect with God as we're all dealing with our own journey of healing our own feminine energy. Mm -hmm. But, um, but if God confirms this for you, um, sometimes when you're dealing with a very domineering spouse, you stepping into your feminine energy can be what turns that energy off for your spouse that helps them realize um their effect on us because i think one of I, I talk a lot about feminine vulnerability in my book and the power of it um because as women in the modern age we're taught to not be vulnerable and that it's bad to cry in public it's bad to have big feelings um you know I think none of us wants to look unhinged as we like feel our feelings wherever mm. we are you know um because sometimes you will. <laughs> it's true. Sometimes you will. I, sometimes I, I feel like I'm like quite unhinged, you know, I don't know. That's how I feel like I look like, right? But, um, but when we swallow down all of our feelings, men don't see how much they're hurting us. And so when, when your, when your husband is saying something that's mean to you and it hurts your feelings and you bottle it down, or you, you, you pretend it doesn't hurt you, or you snap back and attack him back, it's contributing to this really unhealthy dynamic. Whereas if you are vulnerable and actually just let him see, like you said a mean thing to me and I'm, I feel sad and I'm going to cry. Like I'm just sad, you know, without attacking him. When we just allow ourselves to be vulnerable, it totally shifts the whole dynamic. Mm. You know, this, this had just happened yesterday. I hope my husband's cool. If I share this story, he, he had a hard day. He had a bunch of stuff going on. He's like coming down with, with like a cold or something. And, and I came in and I asked him a question that I can't remember. And then I asked it, I asked it again. It was something like very innocuous. Like, have you seen the kids? You know, no, have you, but have you seen the kids? And he was like, no, I haven't seen them. And he just like, you know, yelled at me like a person who's had a really hard day and is tired and getting sick. And he just like suddenly snapped and, and he said, you know, afterwards, he's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I'm just, I'm feeling sick. I had a hard day. And normally I would have just walked away and like <laughs> been angry. But yesterday I just cried. You know, he was like, he was like, Ali, come back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And, and I did come back and I just cried. And I said, I know that you're sorry, but you really hurt my feelings. So I'm going to cry about it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like those moments, I don't know, I'm going to cry again, but um, those moments that we vulnerably share when we are hurt, like those are the moments that teach them not to do that again. You know, mm -hmm. when we don't, but here's, I didn't say, you're so mean. How dare you speak to me like that? I had a hard day too. You know, when we go into that mode, then they're on defense and we're on defense. We can't get defensive. We have to stay vulnerable and just allow ourselves to feel those feelings and to express them with our physical bodies without it being an attack and when we do that everything changes but I think a lot of times when women find themselves in these really abusive marriages uh one question that they may ask themselves is, am I am I allowing my husband to see how he is affecting me in a vulnerable way 
that does not trigger his self defenses because when we start attacking and being being mean about how they've been mean to us even if they were mean to us when we be mean back it makes them defensive and mm. it stops the possibility of progress when we just allow ourselves to feel hurt and show it in their presence everything starts to change mm. yeah you cover this really well in the book it's something that i learned in therapy um, but the idea of making everything about you when you're expressing those feelings, instead of saying you did this and you make me feel like this and you're so bad at this, saying, I just feel this. And I know that what I'm feeling is not necessarily a true reflection of how you feel, but this is how I feel right now. And just totally owning it takes it off of them, right? Because when you come at them throwing all these you statements, yeah, you're you're accusing them, you're attacking them, you're doing the same thing that you feel like they're doing to you. And that's not going to fix the problem, right? And so taking ownership for your emotions in a way that is non-confrontational to allow them to process it and say, oh, this is her. It's not about me. Like they don't have to take it so personally. Because I think that's something that we've witnessed too, um, is trying to have a conversation about you, but because of the words that you're using, they're making it all about them. And so then that's even more frustrating and it kind of it kind of exacerbates the problem yeah oh yeah that is so true mm -hmm. we got to keep it about us <laughs> right 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 just take take ownership and take accountability for what is yours right like don't unnecessarily take blame or don't say oh it's my fault i i know what you know that's that's not healthy either but um yeah i like you to talk about that so what other keys would you have for, let's do both. Let's do for men and women to kind of step into your correct energy. How do we begin to even do that? I mean, we've, we've talked about it a little bit for women, but just to put it really clearly for those who want this practical application. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wrote this giant book about it. It's 400 right. pages. <laughs> so I'm going to recommend the whole book, but yes. But I think for women, if you want to, if you want to leave here today and have something practical you can do to connect with your own feminine energy, I'm going to recommend that you set a timer for five minutes and you feel the feelings inside of your own body. What does your body feel right this minute? And you're going to close your eyes and take your deep breaths and notice the physical sensations of your body. Uh, and if you feel numb, you're going to feel that numbness. As much as you can, you're going to feel that numbness and you're going to describe to your own self, you know, I feel my heart beating. I feel my head buzzing or pounding or whatever, whatever sensations you've got, you're going to feel them and describe them to yourself. And this is one of the most powerful ways that that women can access their own intuition and their own connection with with God and our bodies. We experience God through the medium of our bodies. So the greater connection we have with our own bodies the easier of a time we're going to have hearing the voice of God. Mm. For men, I would say that your greatest power is going to be with um, with logic and making decisions. And what I would invite men to do is um, take an inventory of your life. And and if you're if you're single, of your life as a single man. If you're married, your life with your spouse. And um, I want you to to think about how much you are leading your family and how much responsibility you are currently taking with your behavior for the health of your family, for the finances of your family, um, for, you know, the, the maintenance of your house. Like, is there a project that your wife has been nagging you about and you're not doing it for whatever reason, maybe because you feel like she's trying to control you, she's trying to force you. You'll get to it when you have, have time. She's nagging you because she can't fix this. And she needs you to do it. And she's probably not approaching it in a very feminine way. And if she were, you'd be a lot more happy to do it. But if you actually exert the masculine energy to go and, and fix your own house, to take some responsibility for your kid's medical care, you know, go talk to your wife and find out what, what is going on with all of your kid's health situations or your wife's health situation. Can you be the one that starts calling the doctor? I'll give you a hint. Um, doctors don't respect women. I That is the horrible thing, but I think every mom has had an experience where doctors have ignored us and belittled us. And when a man shows up and says, my kid has this problem, 
they treat that kid differently and they treat that kid better. You being involved in your child's health situations in at the school, at anything in your whole family's life, it's going to change your life. It's going to change your kid's life. And so for men, I'm going to invite you to just sit down and make a list of all the things going on in your life and to really um, ask yourself, am I hanging out, relaxing and receiving, or am I being the masculine force that's leading and guiding and protecting and providing for my family in this aspect of my life? And you're going to use your masculine logical brain to reason this out, and then you're going to make yourself a plan for how you're going to be more masculine in these areas. And again, masculine masculine energy is healthy leadership and the, the, again women can exert healthy leadership as well i feel like i do i feel like you do running your podcast right we're doing this um but men your job is to exert healthy leadership how are you exerting healthy leadership over the meals in your family in your family you know how are you exerting healthy leadership over um you know your kids education how are you doing this? So you're going to just be logical about it, reason it out and, and start making a plan of how you're going to take more action, how you're going to take stuff off your wife's plate that she shouldn't be carrying. If you're a single man, uh, you get to um, make, make some decisions about how you're going to, how you're going to lead your life. What do you, what do you want to get out of life anyway? And you're going to start start going for it. Lead your own life. That is the essence of masculine energy. Go out and lead yourself. Yeah. Well, what a countercultural thought. I love, I love those very practical approaches. I love how it plays to our strengths, right? It is very masculine to be uh, very mind centered, right? The thinking, the logic and the feminine is to be in touch with your physical body and your intuition. Um, part of my lesson in that was that the Lord told me to give birth naturally. And that was a really, really fun and one of the best experiences in my life and such a great way to step into that feminine energy, right? Of learning what my body is actually saying and experiencing to bring forth life. I think that that's a wonderful example of what the feminine energy is. Um, you know, you, you mentioned and emphasized healthy leadership. I think that is so important and healthy leadership. The pattern that our God has given us is servant leadership. It is stooping down to wash someone else's feet. And our men can only do that if they have someone that they can serve. And so in some ways, this is a way that we can step into being a queen and a priestess is letting our husband serve us. Um, and I think that that is something that the Lord is pleased with. One kind of final question, and then we'll wrap up. I could I could talk to you much longer about this. But I'd love to hear how understanding this dynamic has taught you more about your heavenly father and your heavenly mother and your potential to become a queen and a priestess in the same pattern as our heavenly mother. The story that comes to my mind is of a time that that after I had discovered all this feminine energy and things had gotten so much better, uh, something happened uh, in, you know, my primary relationship where I, I said, oh, this, this kind of thing, you know, some marriages don't always survive this kind of thing. And I, uh, and I asked, I asked God about it. And I, I said, you know, what just happened is kind of a mess. Um, but I, I told God, I don't feel super upset about it. You know, I know that uh, many people, many people, this would be a nuclear disaster of of their life. But for me, I'm I'm feeling kind of okay. I said, God, what do you think of that? And I felt like God said, um, He said, Yeah, that's right. Good job. Because you know what, our our spouses do um, do their own lives, and I just felt like God said that um, even though I'm married and married in the temple and everything, my life is up to me, and and my spouse's life is up to him. And I just felt like God said, um, I have complete control over my happiness in the eternities. You know, it doesn't matter what my spouse does. I'm going to be happy. Like if I choose that I'm going to be happy, like I'm going to be happy and I'm going to have a great time. And, and God just said, you know what? You don't have to worry about, um, about the choices that your spouse is making. Um, you get to worry about you and there's not that much to worry about actually. Like you don't have to worry about him and you, you, you just have to worry about you, but also you don't actually have to worry about you because, um, you know, you're, you know what to do and you're doing those things and it's okay. And 
I don't know that I've shared the story before, um, but but that experience uh, really kind of set me free. And I, I feel like it taught me a lot about the nature of God and how much God wants us to be happy and that, yeah. that it's okay for us to just do what we know is right and allow the other people in our lives to make the decisions that they make. And it's okay for us to step forward and just trust that God's got it under control. If we're, if we're taking responsibility for our own selves, other people can't really derail it for us, but you know, we, we get, we're going to get what, what we deserve to get in the end. So thank you. That's beautiful. I think that ties really, really well back to the idea of this being our process of sanctification, right? Coming into a true balance between us and God, between our spirits and our bodies, and then ultimately with our spouse, that's like the celestial version, right? But we have to go through that that sanctification of ourselves first. And when we do, when we become integrated and aligned in and of ourselves, it allows us greater capacity to bear with other people who are not as integrated yet, or communities or churches or nations. If we are properly aligned to God and in ourselves, we will be given patience and grace and charity beyond our natural measure that will allow us to navigate other people who haven't figured it out, right? Who are still working on that, which is so important because as we see in this whole dynamic, um, spouses are unlikely to both get there at the same time right? But we have the ability to impact our relationship by controlling ourselves, not by controlling our spouse, but by bringing this balance into ourselves. And then in doing that, we enable and we invite them to do the same thing. And they hopefully will choose to, they might choose not to, but as you said, either way, my first alignment was between me and God. And so at the end of the day, like you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay as an individual. And God so respects the ability of each of us to make our choices and they are okay with that they are okay with that i really have come to believe that god is not even really disappointed in their children anymore because they are so aligned they are so aligned to spirit to the universe to themselves and to each other that they have a stability and a balance that is unmatched um, and so that's our goal. And, and I've witnessed that too. I've witnessed things in my marriage, in my life that would be really upsetting. And I know a lot of people were heartbroken and, and, and relationships ended same thing. Um, and I've, I've had that same <laughs> strange piece, a piece that only Jesus Christ can extend because it is so odd <laughs> to be okay in situations that you feel like you should not feel so okay about. Um, but that is the piece that surpasses understanding, right? That that our savior wants to give us. And we receive that as we are sanctified and as we come into unity in all these ways. Ali, thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and your ministry and for being vulnerable, for being a great example of a beautiful feminine energy for us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Are you just reading the scriptures or have you learned to search them? If you haven't switched to using scripture notes, you haven't discovered the power of a tool designed for searching the scriptures. This incredible tool allows you to pull together search results from the standard works, apocryphal texts, and freedom documents into a collection you can study from. Digging deeper with instant references to Blue Letter Bible, the LDS Citation Index, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and more. You can even import your gospel library notes as well. Sign up now for a free trial at scripturenotes.com.